appreciate that solo. It was very inspiring and preparing my heart to preach. I wanted to say uh, good morning. And I would also like to uh, encourage any of you that have any anticipation of uh, giving a word from the scriptures on one occasion or another, whether it be a nursing home or a funeral or something of that nature, that the homiletics course, I want to invite you to uh, take advantage of it. It really is fast and furious, as some of these courses are. Within five weeks, we've covered the kind of ground that uh, many of us in the past year have spent uh, uh, unending months and then duplicated again in uh, another occasion over the years to uh, sharpen the tools. But it would be a, a tremendous help to you if you would spend that time with us to take the Word of God and to open the pages of this word in any setting, whether it be here in the pulpit on a Sunday morning or on an, any other occasion around a campfire with teens or whenever, to open the word of God and to begin to exposit the word, to speak of the message of God from the word is a very sacred moment. And to handle the word of God is to handle the word of uh, God Almighty and the word that is timeless and heart-changing and something that none of us, including myself, your pastor, or any that you've ever known, are equal to the task. It was Paul who said, as he spoke of his calling and his place, who is equal, who is sufficient for such a task as this. And uh, so it's an opportunity it's not just necessary that you be following along with the Calvary School of the Bible. If you would like to jump in and get some help in this area, tuck it under your belt, and be better prepared for the time ahead. See you tonight at 4 o'clock downstairs. The Song of Peace is the umbrella of these messages, the, the songs that we never sang, and today... We come to that passage of scripture that we've just read, the Song of Peace. Songs. Songs are uh, tools by which all our generations have been marked. It's interesting that uh, I'm old enough to remember another time when there was a tremendous amount of uh, uh, hatred on the streets and a time of rioting, boycotts and such. During the 60s and the early 70s, the songs uh, were uh, numerous, in some way beyond count, crying out for peace. I look back in my memory, and I dug up one that uh, I think pretty well says a lot of what was happening then, and the particular lyric I pull out of it is just as well something that's happening today. Not too many of you remember Cat Stevens and remember Peace Train. Peace Train came out, it was first released in 1971. We were still in Vietnam. The riots were still going on, boycotts and various other responses were going on. And uh, Peace Train came along with so many others, blowing in the wind and others. And I picked out these lyrics in the midst of it now I've been crying lately, thinking about the world as it is. Why must we go on hating? Why can't we live in bliss? Because out on the edge of darkness, there rides a peace train. Oh, peace train, take this country. Come, take me home again. The cry for peace from the words of a songwriter and singer. The cry for peace in song, a way in which a generation seeks to communicate to the people on the street and on the other side of the radio, or at that particular time that was the case. We come to a song, though, today that is a different song, but yet still announcing the possibility of peace. Not just the reality of it, but also the possibility of it. 
In this song, we have the core. We have the absolute foundation. We have the heartbeat. We have everything that will make peace now and make peace lasting and make peace forever for the soul that embraces its truth. Cat Stevens simply said there rides a peace train on the edge of darkness and uh, cries out, come and take me home again. We don't need to cry out for the peace train. We need to simply embrace the Prince of Peace, and that is the one that we will take time this morning and think about. And so as you were in your Bibles before, as the word was read in our time of Bible and Scripture reading, we come back to it. I've been assigned to address uh, verse 8 through 20, and I also will be speaking to some of you this evening about how it was that I dealt with this passage. So I kind of have two things in my mind, because if I don't deal with this correctly, how can I possibly teach this evening how to correctly deal with passages of Scripture? And so we look at this passage, and we see an historical account. Oh, I could say story, but I typically try to shy from using that phrase on something that we're reading in the Scriptures uh, of a narrative of a moment in time. This was an historic moment. It wasn't a story that was made up, or it wasn't a legend. It wasn't something that was just kindly thought of as the uh, writer Luke put together the facts and, and heard these things. This is an event that took place. And this event began in verse 8 as a follow-up from the announcement of the uh, calling of people uh, together for uh, a taxation. And so in verse 8 we read, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they may know the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Is peace ever achieved worldwide? Is there ever a means by which peace was actually successful? Whenever I come to the subject of peace, I appreciate this particular statistic. Over the 3,400 years of recorded uh, history, putting together isolated events where the world was uh, without a war going on, over those 3,400 year years, the total amount added up to about 8%, a total of 268 years. Again, that's the combination of isolated occasions when there was not war, hostilities going on. So, uh, peace is elusive, isn't it? It's a hard thing to get hold of. As a matter of fact, is it really even possible? And if it were possible, where would it begin? Well, in this passage of Scripture, at verse 8 through verse 10, we hear of the promise of peace. We hear of a promise that is announced. But uh, before the actual outcry of the angels and the singing, we see the shepherds in the field. We see the shepherds as they are caring for their flocks. A pastoral scene. 
looked like a very peaceful setting. But was it? These were shepherds that were castaways by the very fact of their employ. They were looked down upon because they were unable to participate as others in the traditional holy days and the expectations of the pharisaical teaching. They were looked upon very often and for good reason, for many of them were thieves and robbers. They were just not those that observed their care of sheep and the profit to be made, but they were those that were rough and a, a very burly group of individuals. If anything, they represented the common man and the struggles with life and the, the sense of being just caught up with the, the sins of, of life and, and the struggles in which they dealt with inappropriately and incorrectly. But they were also those that were living under the peace offered to them, promised to them from another source, and yet having seen it fail again and again and again. What a contrast Arnaldo Magliano wrote concerning this particular time period. What a contrast this peace that we're reading about in this passage of scripture is with the Romans offered. What the Roman government offered, Caesar Augustus, was the age of what was known as Pax Romana. That is, that the Roman emperor called for peace on earth. Now his idea of peace on earth, the peace that Rome sought to achieve, was a peace that uh, was somewhat different from what we would think peace to be. As a matter of fact, it came at a very devastating cost. Nations were subjugated and plundered, peoples enslaved, the poor oppressed. There were peace and prosperity for a few, fear and poverty for others. Caesar only gave peace as long as it was consistent with the interests of the empire and the myth of his own glory. And now to the shepherds comes the promise of peace. That promise it starts with a simple announcement, fear not. The removal of their fear as they're overwhelmed by what they see, supernatural appearance of the angels, unusual, out of the ordinary. These are individuals that faced lions and tigers and bears, oh my. They struggled to protect their sheep, not only from the wildlife, but from others that would rob them and take the life of their sheep. And now suddenly a host from heaven, suddenly the angel appears and they are frightened. And the first words that are given have to do with that which will be announced concerning peace. The promise, fear not, allow us to remove from you the fear and the sense of uh, sudden uh, turmoil in your heart and allow us to give you a renewal of life. Because as they say, fear not, they go on to say, as the individual angel speaking says, I bring you good news. Good news, that which later as we follow in the gospel accounts of the, of the uh, four gospels into the proclamation of Acts and on good news is the evangelism. It is that which we get the word evangelizing, the announcement of that which is God's news of good that is yet to come, good to be found in his saving work. Good news. And there is no better good news than that news that will deliver you from the bondage of mankind and the evil of your own heart will deliver you from sin and its devastation on your life and the life of your world. Good news, a renewal, a time of new beginning. And then that song of peace is going to be given. This announcement, this promise is made of great joy, of great joy. It's not the song, it's the, pre it's, it's the predecessor of the song, of that which will be proclaimed by the heavenly host. But it is the laying of the groundwork. Here is the promise. You no longer need to fear. 
that fear is now being removed. You no longer need to, to uh, have a sense that things will never change. It's a day of new things. Great, great things coming. Good news. And it's a day of great joy. But as that promise is given, so many promises had been given by Caesar, it never came true. And we can look at this and we can think to ourselves, well, what about the time the peace train was written? What about Cat Stevens' thought? Now I've been crying lately, thinking about the world as it is. Why must we go on hating? Why can't we live in bliss? Why? Is this possible? I hear what the angel is saying, but is there a reason for me to fear not? Is there a reason for me to believe that good news is, is on the threshold? Is there a reason for me to actually have great joy coming? To many of us, we've had joys at Christmas, and we've had other Christmases not so joyful. We've had dear friends that uh, we uh, just uh, were given the announcement that uh, she had passed away two days ago gone into the presence of the Lord. And uh, he is a good friend of mine, uh, Harry Hare, who had pastored a number of years when I was pastoring in Williamsport, and we knew he and Lynn very well. Their Christmas will be in the immediate expression of joy. It will be quite a, a struggle. They will have the joy that they know where Lynn is. They will have the joy that uh, wells up from within, but it is going to be mixed with the grief and the sadness of their loss. And I'm sure there are some here that struggle. This may be your first Christmas with uh, a grief that you're dealing with, as well as having that inner joy. And that's really the key to this entire song, isn't it? And that is that there is not something here that's a false promise, an empty promise. And it's not something that takes away the hardships of life all at once. For the hardships of life, as Jesus himself promised the disciples as he was going soon to the cross, he says, in this world you will have trouble. He stated that. But I give you peace. And so that's something you always want to keep in mind. The promise of peace takes us to the person of peace. Because as we come to that 11th verse, he come out of the promise, fear not, good news, great joy, to the reason that that can be made known. For he says, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. God is breaking in. And he's breaking in in a way completely out of the norm, not in the courts of the king. God is breaking in in the city of David, for it is in the city of David that all of the promises that had to do with Messiah and all the promises deeply rooted in David's lineage was noted at the very outset. And then the only occasion in the New Testament writings where these three titles for Jesus were given all at one point. We read where he is referred to as Savior, read where he's referred to again and again as Christ, referred to as Lord, on occasions with two of them together. But in this particular announcement, unique over all others, the angel says, as he speaks, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The theological content that cannot and must not be overlooked because the song of peace will be sung on the basis of these truths, these titles, this identity. Some mornings in my devotions, I will take time to set aside the uh, list that I have accumulated over the years of, of the titles of God as well as the attributes of God. And it, it feeds into my time of worship and into my time of reflection of what it is I'm seeking to achieve in my time with him. 
They tell me so much about God and who he is. They tell me of God as a diamond, having the facets that just seem to brilliantly shine forth, his glory, his majesty. Such is the case as we look at these three titles. Savior, yes. And you will name him Jesus. So the angel had given to Joseph because he will save his people from their sins. Savior. You see, there can be no peace until we experience salvation. And that is salvation from the sin that wells up within us and who basically dominates our lives. Salvation from that which uh, carries us through life in a, in a state of darkness. Salvation from that which has caused separation from God himself and separation from others. And recently listening to R.C. Sproul's lectures on the subject of sin, focusing in on the concept that it's a separation even from our own self. And that's the reason we'll wake up on any given day and we look in the mirror and say, I hate myself. Because sin has just dominated. And we need a savior. And we can't have peace we can't have peace with our neighbor. We can't have peace with God. We can't have peace with ourselves until we have a Savior to set us free so that as we're in Paul's word to the Romans, as we're justified therein, we find peace with God. And Paul's letter to the Ephesians, until we have a Savior who breaks down the walls of hostility, we cannot have peace one with another. There cannot be peace, as Paul writes to the Philippians, a peace that is an overwhelming peace, a peace that wells up within our lives and guards our hearts and our minds. That is the peace that comes from the person of Jesus Christ, no other source, not from a religious philosophy, but from a person who is known as our Savior, but also the anointing one, the anointed one, Christ. Is that really important, or is it just a title? The Old Testament is replete with messianic promises. A Messiah is coming. All the way back to the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy, where it is spoken that there will be another that will come after Moses has come and gone. And so that one, that Messiah, will come, the anointed one, all the way back to Genesis 3, yes, as it speaks of the seed of the woman. But what about that which Jacob speaks about as he goes on with his reflections and then his prophecy concerning his sons? And he speaks of Judah. And he says that, the, he says that this uh, time of, of, uh, of anointing will come and uh, the scepter will not depart from Judah until that Christ, that anointed one, comes. This is the one. This is the one. There is no other. There is no other means for peace, for there is no other Christ. There is but one, and it's the one that this song will tell us and speak of and sing of. And then, of course, not to be overlooked, tied together with the other two is Christ the Lord, the one who has authority, the one who has the authority not only to save, not only to fulfill all the promises messianically, but the one who has the authority to rule our lives. David prayed as he was uh, setting aside and anointing Solomon as the next king of Israel. And he prayed as he did so to the Lord, the one to whom all is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. And he says, both power and might come from you. In your hand, it is to make great. In your hand, it is to give strength to all. And in that same prayer, he speaks, and you are exalted as head above all. It is in that spirit that we come to that which we acknowledge, Christ the Lord, when one comes to salvation, 
We don't come to the saving work of Jesus Christ as a mere prize in the package of the cereal. We come to the one who has given his life. This one who is sung about can only bring peace, not in that manger alone, for that is simply the entrance of the Savior. It is the exit that brings peace, for it is in his blood that is shed. And so Paul writes to the Colossians, it is in his blood shed for us that we find peace. And in that blood shed, he now has the right, having purchased us, as he calls us to salvation, as he draws us to himself, he has the right to take the throne of our lives. He was not born in the city of David. He was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. He was born in Bethlehem, and it was announced to common men, common individuals like you and like me. And he was given that place, not only to offer, but to take our lives and set us free from the dominion of sins and take the throne of our lives, not the throne that one day he will sit upon, but first and foremost, the throne of this heart and yours, the person of peace. Without the person of peace, there is no peace. Without the person of peace, peace train goes on. Peace train will go on and down the road and back into the darkness. Without the person of peace, there will be no peace. In verse 13 and 14, we read the actual song or the actual announcement. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. A statement that is continually and consistently, whether it be in hymns and other writings, completely shortened. And peace to man. Short. That's a peace to man. The people of peace, the people of peace, in these two verses, and then back to verse 10, and the angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news, a great joy that will be for all the people. Carries with us all the people and with whom he is pleased, two truths. One, the universal truth, and that is the universal offer. Jesus gave the universal offer. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. The universal offer, a genuine and a sincere offer, peace being offered to all men. In this particular case, starting with and the wording is particularly specific. Great joy will be for all the people, initially to the people of Israel. So Christ came as the Messiah of Israel. But all the people, whether they be the Pharisees, or whether it be Simeon and Anna, to all the people. But what's the difference between the Pharisees that called for the crucifixion of Christ and Simeon and Anna and Nicodemus, all of the Messianic people, all of those that waited and looked for their Messiah, the Pharisees completely missed it. It is the same today. All the people here, but not all the people are those with whom he is pleased. The universal and the unique. Those that are unique in the sense that they have been set apart as the elect of God, as the chosen of God, as the ones through whom the Spirit of God has brought great conviction and has drawn them, as Jesus said in John 6, that no one will come unto me except the Father draw them. And God began, when you came to Jesus Christ as your Savior, when I came, you remember well that there was something prodding at you, someone prodding at your heart. There was a light beginning to dawn in your mind and your heart that you didn't quite understand at the time, but you came to that moment that you, with a free will as you best understood it, you said yes to Jesus Christ. Why was that? Because the Spirit of God had drawn you. 
Uh, the Father had spoken to you and had begun bringing conviction to your heart, precisely what Jesus speaks of in John 16. And as he began that work in your heart, you came to that moment that you said yes, and you became a person of peace. And you weren't one who was just qualified for it. Interesting that God chose for the announcement to be made to the shepherds. The castaways, known for being thieves and robbers and dishonest and uh, characters of all sorts, says to you and says to me, nothing in your life is too horrible. Nothing in your life is too great a sin. Nothing in your life is so dark and dismal. Nothing in your life is... Uh, possible to keep you so separated from God that there is not the promise of peace for you too because the person of peace died for you. He died and as he hung on a cross, he looked across the crowd, including those that had sneered and ridiculed him and placed him on that cross. And he cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, what a wonderful truth. This is great joy. This is a reason to have no fear. This is a reason for us to move forward, knowing this is the good news. But the people of peace, having received that peace, what do we do with it? We come this morning, we sing the songs, we come on uh, uh, next uh, Saturday, or next, uh, on, on, uh, or rather Friday on Christmas Eve, and then on Saturday as we celebrate Christmas, and there's so many things that go on, and so many things have to do with the celebration. Let's take a look at the prospect of this peace before we jump into the celebration alone, into the food, and into the trees, and all of the other things that were caught up. We're told in verse 15 through 20 here that these men, these shepherds, these rough and tumble characters, they heard the message. Did they go back and sit there and say, about that. Wasn't that something? And then, uh, you know, talk to themselves about the next uh, adventure they're going to be on or uh, about the past adventures. No. They said, let us go. Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that happened. I trust that's why you're here today, because you've experienced the peace and you've come to hear and to be renewed and to be challenged from the word of God to be reminded of what has happened in this message and in your life. And it was an engaging event for them by which they said, let us go. And not only let us go, but having seen in verse 17, when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. They left and they became evangelists. They were, for all intent and purposes, the first New Testament evangelists. And it's rather interesting that they fulfill this truth of the seventh verse of Isaiah and 52. How beautiful. Upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. The prospect of peace is not just to have it, but to send it to give it, to proclaim it, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. May this Christmas be a season whereby you fulfill the prospect of peace, received it, now send it, now give it. Now be what the Lord spoke of, along with the Varied beatitudes, blessed, happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. To sing the song of peace, to know the truth of peace, to know the person of peace. Mary gave us an example of what to do with it, to treasure it within our hearts, to treasure it, to roll it over and over again. And allow that peace to continue to change you and to cause you to be as you have been predestined to be. As Paul wrote in Romans 8, we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. He is the person of peace. And we're to go forth and be proclaimers of that peace and to follow in the path as 
he has sent us. Go into all the world and to tell the story, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Mary treasured it and she pondered it. There were those that wondered and our world is full of those that wonder and do nothing about it. It's sad to say that there are even God's people who will find themselves often wondering because they've lost touch with the real heartbeat and the power and the force of what we are seeing here, the song of peace, the truth of peace, the person of peace. There is a hymn that we sing, and I'll bring you to that as we come to the end. Henry Longfellow wrote this in 64. That's 1864. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. He wrote it during the Civil War. He wrote it with a sense of somewhat discouragement because they could not see peace in anywhere around him. And so, again, five verses that are currently still available in most hymns. The third verse, and in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then he ends in the fifth verse, the ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime, a peace on earth, goodwill to men. He resolves his grief by turning to the fact that there is peace, yet God is not dead, he writes in the fourth verse, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. As we come to the end, I remind you of the passage we so often hear quoted, part of Christmas stories found, the messianic passage, the promise, but I want you to think as you're looking at the person of peace in this song of peace. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. You look for the world to be a world of bliss, as Cat Stevens cries out for. Look for a world to be a world of peace. That peace begins with the Prince of Peace taking the government upon his shoulder. And before the government of this world can be taken upon his shoulder, he comes knocking at the door of your heart and he says, allow me to take the government of your life and place it upon my shoulder. And if you will allow me to take the government of your life upon my shoulder, then the government of your life will be a government of peace that will only continue to increase as I rule on the throne of your heart. This is a song that has good resolution. This is a song that speaks to each and every one of us. It is a song that is a promise fulfilled. And I plead with you today, those who are here and those who are with us online, that if you have never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never come to the one who is the Lamb of God, the one who is the child in a manger, if you've never come and take your government of your life upon him, You'll still struggle in the darkness and you'll still lack peace. There'll be no peace until you come face to face, heart to heart, and surrender to the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how grateful we are that what we hear of and see in the announcements of the Christmas story tell us that you care for us and you cared enough to send your only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that would be a life of peace that will only increase. 
If there be any who are listening to us online, if there be any here today that have never taken that step, the Christmas tree may have many gifts, but there is no greater gift than that gift that you have offered, the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus. May you touch hearts and continue to draw them to yourself this very day. We ask, O oh Lord, that we will take this message home with us and into our family gatherings, into our workplace and our community, and as the shepherds of old, take that message of the Prince of Peace to the world who is hungry for peace today and be the proclaimers of peace in Jesus' name.